um, very much like to put people in pigeonholes, but uh, that is certainly not the case for tonight. So our, our speaker, Ilario, Ilario Kayazzo, is, uh, has expertise in both uh, theoretical physics and theoretical uh, astrophysics and observational physics, which is itself rare. Uh, she's um, Sherman Fairchild Fellow at Caltech. Her expertise is on stars and white dwarfs, what she's going to tell you about tonight. But she also, besides theory and observation, has a big interest in instrumentation. So she's a project scientist for Calibri, which is a proposed concept for a high resolution X ray telescope. And that was designed to, to investigate neutron stars and black holes beyond, well, not beyond, but uh, in addition to the kinds of things that she's going to tell us about tonight. In addition to that, what really well, impresses me, because we're always impressed, more impressed, I think, we're not able to do ourselves. Uh, but she's worked as a writer and a movie producer, and her, uh, her latest short movie she me, that she produced is called The Recycling Man, so you can find it on YouTube, and it's available through the science fiction platform Dust, but it's won several awards and international film festivals. Uh, so I encourage you to watch that after you've heard about <laughs> science, maybe fiction, and science fiction, but uh, don't come for people in pigeon house. And thank you for uh, being with us tonight. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me here. I'm ha I've been here for uh, six weeks now uh, because I'm doing the entire Wide Dwarf program and I'm having a lot of fun. This has been an incredible experience. Uh, so much science, so intense that I'm starting all of this collaboration. So I'm so happy to be here at KTP. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about some of the works that I've been doing. Actually, some of the works that I've been telling about uh, today, I had just set finalized here, <laughs> so uh, really in-house, really fresh, uh, so to speak. Um, so I'm going to tell you about some extreme white doors, these like tiny, pretty, uh, <laughs> beautiful stars uh, that call white doors. And in particular, I am interested in very mysterious uh, objects, mysterious and extreme white doors. Uh, but I will start from the very basic, and I am sorry uh, because I'm talking with some of you outside, I realized that maybe it can be a bit too basic <laughs> because everyone here is very knowledgeable, but I wanted everyone to be on the same page. And as I was saying, you know, one of the most famous quotes from Fermi is I can never estimate uh, how much people like to be told what they really know. So, <laughs> if you already know this, uh, just enjoy the pretty uh, pictures. So, let's start from what are white dwarfs. So, white dwarfs are, in, so the short answer is that white dwarfs are the most common star corpses. So, more than 95% of all stars in the sky are destined to become white dwarfs when they die. The sun will become a white dwarf, uh, for example. And, but what do we mean when a star dies? So the life of a star uh, is a continuous fight. It's a continuous fight against its own collapse. Because stars are giant ball of gas, they are self-gravitating, <coughs> and they are so massive that the gravitation uh, is very strong and tends to make them collapse. And so you need some source of energy to keep them up against their own self-gravity. Uh, and for uh, stars, uh, what defines a star is it has some fusion going on in their core. As you know, the sun is fusing hydrogen into helium right now. Um, and, that's, and that's what keeps it up. And it's really a delicate balance. I mean, this, every star burns just as much as it needs to keep up. So for uh, bigger stars, they need to burn more uh, to keep up against gravity. 
Uh, and that's why bigger stars, more massive stars, last much less. Uh, the, the lives are much shorter. So the sun, you know, right now is about half away, it's life five billion years, much more massive stars. Sometimes um, they, they last maybe a few million years, a few tens of million years. So, um, and that really all depends on the mass. They just need to keep up so much more mass and they add more fuel, but they go through it much faster. Uh, and it's not only hydrogen into helium, as you know, right now the, hydrogen, the sun is burning hydrogen into helium, but when the helium is over in the core, what happens to the star is that it will stop burning in the core, and so the core will start to contract and contract. Uh, again, gravity there, and then the outer layer will expand, and it will become a red giant. And then when the, star, when the core contracts enough that it becomes hot enough, for helium to ignite, then we start with the second phase of burning, which is the helium burning phase. Um, and then you, you have this balance again. The, store, the core will stop contracting and the star is in balance uh, and it can live for quite a long time. But actually each phase, the helium burning phase and then all of the future phases, they last each time a, bit, a little bit less. Uh, and Again, depending on the mass of the star, this can go on for quite some time. So the mass are all born, the stars are all born kind of in the same way, right? Like a giant ball of gas and dust contracting and igniting in the core. But where they end up to, depend, everything depends on the initial mass. Uh, if they are in single, in a binary, that's different. Uh, but for stars that are let's say more massive than eight times, about eight times uh, the mass of our sun, they won't stop at helium burning. They burn helium into carbon and oxygen and oxygen, but then they start burning carbon into oxygen, neon and magnesium, and those they keep going and going. And so what happens is that they will have these envelopes still of hydrogen and then all of these onion shape, this is not to scale, the core is much smaller, <laughs> but they will have this onion shape of all of the different elements that get burned little by little. And then when they arrive to burning silicon into iron, that's the last step. Because you know, each one of these burning provides a little bit less energy. Burning hydrogen into helium provides a lot of energy. Helium into carbon, a little bit less. That's why the lifetime of the helium burning phase is a, bit, a little bit shorter, etc., 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 until you get to silicon that provides very tiny energy. Actually, the silicon burning phase can last a few hours into a start. Uh, and then when you reach iron, that's it. You cannot burn iron into anything else and, and extract energy. Actually, if you have, if you burn it into, if you try to make a more heavy element, you have to provide energy. And, or if you, so there's no way to go be past iron for a star, and so when they reach to the silicon burning phase, that's the end. Uh, that's where we get to the star, the end of the life of the star, and we have the supernova, right? But again, I'm going very fast here because I know that you know all about these, but if you have questions, ask. Uh, but that's for the very massive ones. As I said, above eight solar masses, and those are rare. More than 95% of all stars in the sky are less massive than eight times the mass of our sun. One question. Yeah. It gets to a supernova, and, and it's in balance all the time. But when you get to that, it suddenly explodes. Where does the energy come from for it to explode? Ah, that's, that's a whole another story. <laughs> <laughs> What happens is that the cores start contracting every time, you know, this, the fuel runs out in the core, and so the core starts contracting, right? At each one of them, right? And so, at each at each fusion, it reaches a certain temperature and density when it can start the next one. But if this iron core starts contracting, then there's nothing to do, and so it will just contract, contract, contract until until you get to a point where the core bounces back. And that's where the... It uh, must create energy. I mean, it bounces, it comes in and, and bounces. I understand that, but it's already in. What makes it explode? 
again. <laughs> uh, this is all a whole different story. But it, what happens is that um, you're squishing and squishing. Actually, I, I we're going to get into that for the white dwarf. Maybe we can get that there. So what happens is that uh, when you squish um, protons and neutrons and electrons together, uh, they don't really like to be squished together. And so um, at a certain point, um, I'm not... I'm not an expert of supernovae uh, explosion. It's, it's actually how the supernova explosion happened is quite a delicate thing that involves the bouncy back of the hydrogen core plus the neutrinos. So it's, it's way more complicated than what I'm saying. But <laughs> what happens is that at a certain point, uh, your, uh, your hydrogen, your uh, neutron core, has bec uh, sorry, your, sorry, your iron core has become so dense uh, that the neutron and, and protons in the core um, they start uh, feeling the Pauli exclusion principle, so they start feeling the degeneracy pressure, which I'll get to. So um, um, you're squeezing together uh, fermions, and so they don't like to be squeezed together, so they push back. Uh, but this is actually what keeps up white dwarfs, and so not neutrons and protons, but I'll get to that, and so maybe it's going to become clear later. But that's the initial pushback, and then you have uh, other things going on in a supernova. But again, I'm not a supernova expert, so please ask the next speaker that talks the words about supernova. <laughs> this was just to say, that's what happens for the other 5%. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so what happens for our sun? The sun will not go supernova, <laughs> so it will not uh, explode into supernova. Uh, but the end will still be beautiful. Because what happens is going to happen is that when the sun reaches helium burning, right, and it reaches helium burning, you burn helium into carbon and oxygen, and then again the, the helium finishes in the core, the core starts contracting, but it will never reach the density and, uh, and temperature uh, needed for carbon burning to start. Because something else will kick in first, and I'll tell you about that. And so what will happen is that the core will keep contracting, and the sun will shed part of its mass in the sky, in this, beautifully, in this beautiful uh, phenomenon that are called um, planetary nebulae. Uh, and, um, and the core will remain there contracting, contracting, contracting. And so this is actually what we see in the center of some planetary nebulae. As you can see there, that's the core of the star, the bright dot in the center of this nebulae. Uh, and that is a newly born white dwarf. Uh, so the core of the sun, the core of the stars, after they spell some of their mass in the sky, uh, become the newly born white dwarf. Um, and when it stops contracting, and I will tell you why it stops contracting, when it stops contracting, then you have your white dwarf born, which is, you see, about half of the mass is gone. You can see, for example, there on that scale. Half of the mass is gone. Uh, the white dwarf is about the, half the mass of the sun. But as you can see, it's actually much smaller. <laughs> it has contracted quite a bit. It, has this, it is the size of the Earth about. So half of the sun has contracted into the size of the Earth. Uh, in fact, if you take a spoon of a white dwarf, an hour, like the average density of a white dwarf has the same mass of a very heavy car. So why? Why does it contract so much? And why does it stop? Right? Why does it stop contracting? You know, the normal stars, what stops it from collapsing is the fusion energy. But as I told you, here we never reach the, the, the point where we can ignite carbon, the carbon and oxygen into the core of the white dwarf. Because something else kicks in first that starts balancing, balancing gravity. And this is what we call electron degeneracy pressure. And so I will give you a little analogy to explain how it works when uh, you're trying to squeeze together two fermions. And this happens again for neutrons, when you squeeze them, way more. But here we are talking about electrons. Uh, so, if you imagine in a parking garage, with different, with different stories I, 
uh, at 3 in the afternoon, it's not very busy. Uh, you know, the ground level is still pretty free, everyone will just go and park in the ground level. Um, when you go into rush hour, then the ground level is completely full, and so new cars will have to go at higher level to park. Even if they're not feeling very energetic, they don't want to make the stairs, but whatever, the, the, ground, the ground floor is full, they have to park out, uh, upstairs. Um, and this is exactly <laughs> what happens with electrons. If you have uh, low pressure, if you have low density, uh, electrons can be in the ground state because there is enough space for everyone. Uh, however, when you go to high density, all of the ground states are, all the low energy states are full, and so you, uh, the electrons, even if they're not hot enough, it's not about uh, so, let me explain the analogy a bit better. So, at a low pressure, if an electron goes into a high energy level, it's because it's hot. That's why it's moving fast, right? Low energy level, the electron is moving slowly. High energy level, the electron is moving fast. And to get to a high energy level, you need to, bring, to give it heat, to make it hot. Um, when you're at high density, it doesn't matter uh, how hot your gas is. If uh, the ground levels are full, you have to go to a higher level. And the higher level means that the electrons are going faster and it means they're supply, supplying more pressure. And so this is actually what happens. This is a consequence of the Pauli exclusion principle is because when you squish electrons all together, uh, you, don't, you cannot have two electrons exactly in the same state, exactly in the same space. And that's why uh, you have some electrons that become more and more energetic the more you squeeze them. Yes? That's the Pauli exclusion principle? Yes. Yes. Uh, that's where it comes from. Uh, and so, and this is what's happening in the white dwarf. It's so dense that the electrons in its core, it's not, in, it, you know, in the normal star, what's providing the pressure? It's the heat, the fusion heat. It's providing the, the heat to the electron, and that's why they're moving fast, and that's why they're providing pressure. In the white dwarf, you don't have that heat. You don't have that energy production from the fusion. But the electron has squeezed so much that they're still moving fast because of this effect. And that is what is providing the pressure in the white dwarf. And that's why it stops contracting. You don't have an energy source from fusion, but it still stops contracting because it reaches an equilibrium. It has enough pressure to contrast gravity. And, and that's why it never reaches a density and, and energy high enough to, to burn carbon. Because at a certain point, it stops. And that's where you have your white dwarf. And one... Uh, I was already saying that. But, um, and so that's what spirals gravity. And one crazy conse con consequence about this is that more massive white dwarfs are smaller. <laughs> because if you think about this, if you need, put more mass onto a white dwarf, it will need more pressure to be up. And so you need to squeeze it more to receive that bounce from the electrons. Uh, and so, when you see a white dwarf, if you can measure the radius, we can immediately understand the mass, because there's this relation between the mass of the white dwarf and its radius, uh, which goes, the radius uh, goes as the mass to the minus one third. <laughs> so, the more massive, the smaller it is. And another very important consequence is that the electron cannot just sustain any mass. At a certain point, uh, there's a certain mass, which is about 1.4 solar masses, in which if, if you, the electrons in the core are moving so fast that they are relativistic. They become relativistic. And therefore, it doesn't matter. You can squish them more, but they will not provide enough pressure to sustain the white dwarf. And, and therefore, if you reach that mass, it's the end for the white dwarf. 
it will explode. Uh, yes, I was suppose I actually wanted to ask you what happens, but I already told you. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, it explodes. Uh, and that's what's the origin of this type of supernovae, which are called supernovae type 1a. They're a very important type of supernovae. Because you have, when you have a wide earth exploding, you know, we have a certain mass, you know, the Chandrasekhar mass, that is collapsing and then exploding into a thermonuclear explosion. And therefore, you have, you know, 1.4 solar masses of stuff burning, of carbon burning into nickel and iron, etc. And so you have a, each explosion will be about the same, right? Because you have that thing that is collapsing and exploding. And therefore, type 1 supernovae, we know their luminosity and they're always luminous the same. And therefore, we can use them as standard candles. So if you see a, a type 1a, let's say, in a nearby galaxy, it's going to be a certain luminosity. If you see it in a more distant galaxy, it's going to be a different luminosity. But that difference is only given by the difference in distance, right? Because the intrinsic luminosity is the same. That's what we mean by standard candle. That's why we measure, actually, the distance of galaxies uh, using type 1 supernovae. That's why this is a very important type of supernovae, because that's, that's how we measure the distances in the nearby universe. And this is the, one of the, first, the steps in the scales of measuring the distances in the universe. It's very important in cosmology, for example, to measure the expansion of the universe. So this is why my little introduction about why dwarfs. Uh, and this is just very generic. And I'd like now to tell you about the why dwarfs that I work on. <laughs> Uh, which are uh, very extreme white dwarfs uh, that I find with a telescope called uh, ZTF or the Zuki Transient Facility. Um, so the Zuki Transient Facility uh, is a survey that is based at the Palomar Observatory here in California, about three hours from LA. Um, and this is the observatory, it's very pretty. I actually, I was finally able to go there just in March of this year because of the pandemic. I started using this in 2020, uh, so it never happened to go. So I was there for the first time in March. Uh, but it's very, very beautiful if you happen to be there, go because it's pretty. And we actually use this telescope over here, that is the 48-inch uh, telescope, which was started building in 1939 and was finished building in 1948. So it's pretty old telescope. And here is like seen it a bit closer. And here is seen even a bit closer inside. So in 2017, this pretty old telescope was refurbished uh, with a new instrument, ZTF, uh, and the new camera. Uh, this camera is about 600 megapixels. I think in 2017 was the biggest camera in the world. Now it's not anymore, <laughs> but <laughs> it was at that time. Uh, and what is incredible about this camera and this new refurbishing of the telescope is that we were able to use a very old telescope that was about to be you know, dismissed uh, to find an enormous amount of things. And that is because this huge camera allows us to take a picture of the entire sky very often. So it has a huge field of view. So this is Andromeda, this is the moon, and this is one picture, like this one image taken by ZTF, right? It's a huge field of view. And so within, in about two nights, ZTF can take images of the entire northern sky. Uh, and this is just compared to other surveys, other old sky surveys that are ongoing. This is a future one, maybe you've heard about the Vera Rubin Observatory that is coming up soon. ZTF is still the biggest of all of these optical observatories. Yeah, it, is, it takes images in the optical of the old sky. And this is uh, how much it has taken until now. This is color coded uh, with numbers that go from a few hundreds to 
1,500 for the more observed parts of the sky. But you can see the entire northern sky has been observed hundreds, if not a thousand times. So you have a thousand images from the same part of the sky. And so why do we take images of the same part of the sky over and over and over and over? For several reasons. One reason is to see, actually, there is one reason why you do this, it's to observe things that change. Right, that's why you want to take images one other the other. For example, if you have a type 1a supernova, what I was talking about, going off, and you have a previous image, and then you go back and you take another image, there it is, <laughs> then you can discover supernovae that are very young. Sometimes ETF, it's called the Zwicky Transient Facility, because it looks for transients, and it has been able to discover supernovae within an hour of their appearance in the sky. And so what, what you can do is just go and take a spectrum of the supernova and understand what it is. So we have been able to see supernova very early. And, and other type of transients, um, tidal disruption events, uh, kilonovi, for example, the, one, one of the reasons why ZTF, one of the things that the ZTF is doing is following up the gravitational wave uh, alerts from LIGO to see if in the same part of the sky we see some transit going on. Uh, but I don't work on that. <laughs> I am more interested in stars that are variable. So they're always there, but they change in time. So the luminosity goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Uh, for example, here there are a few light curves. So this is like what, how the light of the star changes with time. These are, is, these are our binaries. Uh, this, is, for example, is a very interesting double white dwarf binary. And you can see there is this big eclipse here. So the light goes down almost to zero because it's not to zero, actually to, uh, yeah, to zero because there's one very bright white dwarf that gets eclipsed by the other white dwarf. And so you, you don't see the other white dwarf. And, and so these are all binaries. But again, I'm not interested in binaries. It's just showing to you uh, all of the things that TTS can do. What I'm interested in is extreme white dwarfs again. So I'm interested in white dwarfs that vary because they're highly magnetized and rotating. And I'm going to explain you why they're exciting, starting from the first one that I studied last year. And it's probably the poster child of the objects that I'm studying. Um, so again, here is the light curve. This is the ZTF light curve. And this is the better light curve that we took with the 200 inch, so a little, tiny, a little bit bigger telescope, still at Palomar. Figure so we can get a um, higher signal to noise. And so again, it's brightness. And this one is changing up and down about 5% in luminosity, 3%, uh, every seven minutes. And this is because the white dwarf is rotating. It's rotating extremely fast. You have to think about it. Something the size, you know, white dwarfs are the size of the Earth, rotating every seven minutes on its axis. Right? It's very, very, very fast. Uh, but here it is in Cancers, and I think in Laquila, it's in the Laquila uh, constellation. I think it's around here. <laughs> okay. But when we saw this light curve, we were like shocked because, you know, all, 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 all stars rotate, all objects in, this, in space rotate, right? Stars rotate. And since star rotates, uh, you expect that when they collapse into the white dwarf, you know, just for the conservation of angular momentum, you want the white dwarf to rotate too. And actually it's going to rotate faster than the star because you're conserving the angular momentum. But the typical rotation speeds of of white doors or, uh, are of hours, two How days. Summers, eh? uh, every 20 days, about 21, 24, something like that. Yeah. But this white dwarf that I found, it's one every seven minutes. So much, much faster than normal white doors and much, much faster than what you would expect from just a single star core contracting into a white dwarf. So that's extreme. Uh, extreme uh, quality number one. Then we decided let's go and take a spectrum of the object. So spectrum of stars are very, very useful 
because when photons go through the atmosphere of a star, they can get absorbed by electrons when they jump between different uh, levels of the, at of the atom, and therefore uh, here is like the spectrum of the white doors. Is, uh, so when you divide the light into uh, the different wavelengths, instead of seeing a uniform uh, rainbow, <laughs> you see some dips. And these dips at a certain energy level, certain wavelengths, that corresponds to the levels of the electrons in the, in the atoms, right? Yes? Um, we've had lectures about astro-seismology, mm -hmm. where stars actually vibrate. Yes. Music of the spheres, music of the stars. Um, does that occur in white dwarfs as well? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. This one is rotating, and we are 100% sure that it's rotating. We can get into that later. Uh, but there are white doors that, that oscillates plenty, uh, and we actually study them a lot. There's a lot of people in this uh, um, this workshop that study so oscillating that's used white doors. To, to analyze what's inside. The to analyze what's inside, and also to understand things about the atmospheres of white doors. So yeah, astro seismology is a great uh, um, is a great tool for white doors, too, not only for for big stars. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as I was saying, depending on where these dips are, we can understand what is on the surface of this object, right? Just on the atmosphere, we, can, we cannot know the interior. To know the interior, we need astro seismology. I mean, for white doors, we, we know it's probably it's mostly carbon and oxygen. Uh, but then on the atmosphere, the atmosphere of white doors, most often is just helium and, and hydrogen. It's like a very thin. A helium layer and then the very thin hydrogen layer and usually since the gravity is so strong only the hydrogen is on the surface because everything else sinks everything that is more heavy sinks right and so usually this is the typical spectrum of a white dwarf all of these lines are lines of hydrogen okay for example another cool thing that you can see in white dwarfs if they have they have been seeing lots of white dwarfs with planetesimal falling onto them and therefore, you can see lines of magnesium, of silicon, or of calcium. And again, all of these lines, you can identify them and say, oh, this white dwarf, we call them polluted. This white dwarf is polluted by planetesimal falling onto the white dwarfs. So that's actually another big branch of white dwarfs that is studying the fate of planetary systems after the central stars die, because we've seen planets around white dwarfs, we've seen debris disks around white dwarfs, and those are telling the story of what happens when the star dies to the planetary system. This is another big branch. This is something else we can get from spectrum. But how do white dwarfs look like this? And I know if you don't stare at white dwarfs spectra a long time, you might not notice how weird it is. But I, believe me, when I saw this, I was like, what's this? <laughs> it's very weird. Uh, and the reason why it's so weird, it's because it is extremely magnetized. The magnetic field changes the energy level of the, of the electrons in the, in the hydrogen atom. And actually, there's been a lot of calculation to see, depending on the strength of the, of the magnetic field, this is like one jump between one level to the other, the energy changes completely, it gets split in three. First, you know, lots of physicists here, like the Zeeman splitting, right? And then as you go to higher and higher magnetic field, you get even more components, you get shifted all over the place. And in this case, we were able to recognize these as hydrogen absorption features in a very high magnetic field. And so this white dwarf that's a 800 million Gauss wow. magnetic field. Okay. <laughs> so it's really extreme. It's one of the highest, highest magnetic fields seen in a white dwarf. It's more than one billion the Earth magnetic field. So it's uh, very, very, very magnetized. And yeah, and this spectrum we got from the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. So extreme property number two. Uh, incredibly strong magnetic field. Okay, so you know this is was asked 
this is, it was really the process. We, saw, we found the white dwarf rotation. We got a spectrum, so the huge magnetic field. Yes. But, but the spectrum is only from the outer surface. So, yes. so like the helium just below, that's not... Part we of don't the see the helium below. We only see hydrogen features, yes. Oh. But that's pretty normal in white dwarfs. I actually we're going to get to another interesting object, but for this one, only hydrogen. Uh, okay, so the next thing to understand is what's the size of this white dwarf, right? And how do you understand the size? Uh, well, the luminosity, you know, the more luminous an object is, usually the biggest it is. Um, um, but of course, that depends also on how efficient it is at emitting light for it, a certain part of the surface. Of course, if it's hotter, a hotter um, object will emit more light, the same light as a colder object, but bigger object, right? This is pretty straightforward. This is wrong, this is a two, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but this is just the usual black body radiation, right? So you can, if you know the temperature, of an object and you know the luminosity of an object then you can get its radius right because the bigger it is the more luminous it is but also the hotter it is the more luminous it is right and so this, this of course there's a lot of this little bit more um subtleties going in because white dwarfs are not exactly bad bodies, there's the opacities of the atmosphere that have to be included, but this is practically what we're looking at. And the other factor that you need to know, of course, is the distance. Because we were talking about the intrinsic luminosity depends on your temperature and on the surface area, but then of course how bright it is depends on distance. And then you can get the radius. You, know, you put together two equations and you get the radius, we know the brightness, we detect it. We know the temperature from the color, right? And what about the distance? That's a very hard thing to do in astronomy, getting the distance of objects. You know, the sky is like this 2D thing that we're looking at. Uh, so getting the distance of object has always been pretty tricky, but luckily, a few years ago, the European Space Agency launched this mission in the sky that has been completely revolutionary in the field of astrophysics. And that is because this tiny, this mission that looks like a hat measured the distance to billions of stars just using the parallax, just, just using geometry, and including our white dwarf. And it actually is a very precise distance extremely precise distance, because this white dwarf is actually pretty, pretty close, it's only 120 parsecs away. But since we have a very good distance, we have the brightness, we have the temperature, we can get a radius of the star. And this is what we got. Remember the beginning I told you that white dwarfs are about the size of the Earth? This white dwarf is about the size of the moon. <laughs> Uh, it's about 3,000 kilometers in radius. This is just comparison on scale. This is the size of this white dwarf. What does it mean that it's so small? Does that mean it's more massive? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, yeah, because you remember the, the white dwarfs are weird, more massive, smaller. So this is extremely small, which means it's extreme. Oh. I had it there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, small radius means large mass. And this white dwarf, this is the size of the moon, actually has about one and a third the mass of the sun packed inside. Uh, it's uh, the, the, most, the smallest white dwarf ever seen, and so also the most massive, and also the closer to the Chandrasekhar mass. It's very, very close to the maximum mass the white dwarf can have. Um, so, this is an extreme uh, characteristic number four. It's incredibly small and incredibly massive. Okay, so these, all of these properties is, are telling us very clearly that this white dwarf was not born the way I told you white dwarfs are born. It is born in a different way. 
This was born in a different way. Because it didn't have one progenitor star, it had two. So two progenitor stars orbiting each other, they both became white dwarfs, and then the two white dwarfs, you know, they get closer and closer because they can emit gravitational waves, and then they can choose, they can merge and create another white dwarf. So this white dwarf is a progenitor, is a remnant of the double white dwarf merger. So you probably heard of like the double neutron star merger from LIGO. So this LIGO cannot detect the merging of two white dwarfs, but LISA, which is a future uh, gravitational wave uh, observatory that is going to be in space, is going to look at different frequencies of gravitational waves, and it will be able to detect binary white dwarfs like this. They orbit each other and they're emitting gravitational waves. Yes? What's the sort of period of that orbit? In it can go, I mean, we have when seen... When they merge, they must be going really fast. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have seen binary white dwarfs. We know of binary white dwarfs. Uh, the shortest period that we have seen is actually around seven minutes. <laughs> uh, so they're orbiting each other every seven minutes. But they can, they, they're going to get much... The thing is that the closer they get, um, the, sh the faster they get closer, right? <laughs> because the closer they get, the, gr the strongest is the gravitational wave emission, and so they lose more energy. The orbital, they lose more orbital energy, and so the, the orbit keeps shrinking and shrinking. So you get that chirp sound. Huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. So most stars become white dwarfs, and Aren't most star systems binary systems? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So does that mean that then most star systems are going to end up in a merger white dwarf? Yes. Uh, well, it, the thing is to merge in a reasonable amount of time, they need to start pretty close. Because the gravitational, as I said, the amount of gravitational waves that get emitted depends on how close they are. Right? So if you start too far, you will not uh, you, I mean, you will merge in several times the age of the universe. So to merge within the age of the universe, you have to start really pretty close. Actually, the progenitor of these, when they become white dwarf, they go through this what is called common envelope evolution, which means that they're so close that when one star expands, it's going to engulf the other one. Uh, and so they, they evolve some common envelope, and so they end up being the white end the ending white doors become very, very close to start with. That's why, that's why we can see a lot of merging, re merger remnants already. Otherwise, it would take too long. But we, there are already some there that have merged in the age, in the time of the age of the universe. So actually, there's lots and lots of mergers out there. And sometimes it can take actually a pretty short amount of time for them to form. But yeah, so this is one of those. And so we just found the foster child of <laughs> white dwarf merger remnants because, I mean, the, all of the things check. The star, you know, is, is the seven minutes because it can inherited the angular momentum of the orbital angular momentum of the two progenitors. Not all of it, some gets lost in the merger, but some of it remains, and that's why it's rotating so fast. Uh, the strong magnetic field, it's also created during the merger because there's very strong dynamos that uh, arise during the merger and it can uh, create very strong magnetic field. And then it's very massive, which makes sense because when you merge two white doors, you get a more massive white door. So, and these very massive white doors from single stars are very rare. Uh, and this one is so close that it has to come from the merger. So this is, this is already very interesting in itself, I would say. We found a merger white door. So this is one that barely barely avoided the supernova explosion. If it was a little bit more massive, the two mergers would have exploded in a type 1a supernova. It, yeah. The strong magnetic field, is that a direct result of this? Of the uh, merger. Location? Yeah, because like during the merger, you have like these very strong dynamos uh, that arise that can create very strong magnetic fields. Yes? How does, the, <coughs> how does the great mass gravitationally affect the any objects nearby? Like burned out planets, for instance, or... Well, it's, it's only a third more massive than the sun. 
So, you know, it's very compact. If, if the planet was very close, then it would definitely affect it in a much stronger way. The thing is, like, with, with objects, with compact objects, what, what matters is not only the mass itself, but how compact they are. That's what determines the strength of the gravitational field. Neutron star, for example, they can be, you know, just the mass of the sun again, or a little bit more massive, but it can get so, they're so compact that the field on their surface is extremely strong. So it can affect, for example, if a planet gets too close, it can get disrupted, right? Uh, and that's actually why we see all of those polluted white dwarf. It's like planetesimals that arrive very close and they get disrupted, they form disks, and then and they accrete on the surface of the white dwarf. One of the other consequences for, what, for the very strong uh, field is what I would, sorry, the very strong yeah, gravitational field is that, uh, as I was telling you before, all the elements sink, sink super quickly. So those polluted white dwarf that I was showing you before, the metals, you know, the silicon and calcium, etc., in the surface, they must have accreted very recently. They must have fallen onto the white dwarf very recently because they sink on a matter of months. So which means that those stuff, this stuff is falling onto the white dwarf continuously. And that's why we see them still there. Because the gravitational field is so quick, so strong, that anything heavier than hydrogen just sinks very quickly. Um, okay, so wow, it's late. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's another consequence for these white dwarfs to be so small. Uh, is that the density in the core of the white dwarf is so high that it's this process that is, was thought to happen only in neutron stars that is probably happening to the core of this white dwarf too. Which, which is called uh, inverse beta decay or electron capture. So protons inside nuclei are capturing electrons and converting into neutrons. Because it, the, 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 it's so dense that it's energetically favorable to have more neutrons in nuclei than protons. And so what happens is that sodium nuclei inside this white dwarf are converting into, sorry, uh, yeah, sodium nuclei in the white dwarf are converting into neon nuclei, <laughs> at, uh, uh, capturing electrons. Uh, and this is, very bad, uh, this is very bad news for the white dwarf because if you remember, the electrons is what keep it up <laughs> from collapsing. And so what can happen is that the more electrons, the electrons get away, they get captured into the nuclei, this white dwarf field starts shrinking. Uh, because you, know, you have more and more protons converting into neutrons and then so the white dwarf uh, will shrink. And it might end up to a point that it cannot sustain itself with electrons anymore. So we still don't know. We still don't know if that will happen. So the white dwarf might survive and never, never collapse. But if it does collapse, then it can either explode into a type 1 supernova, or if the collapse is low and gentle enough, it can actually collapse into a neutron star. Neutron star is the next step of, of, the, elect, of the degeneracy pressure, where I think the object becomes so tiny that now are the neutrons that are squished together. And then uh, those are the ones that support the star, not the electrons anymore. And that's why you can get to such small, much smaller, yes. Where in this process, if you have a large enough white dwarf, can they Carbon start to fuse. Small enough. <laughs> yes. That's massive enough. enough. <laughs> massive enough. Actually, I haven't mentioned this, but this white dwarf is prob it's already probably gone through carbon burning. Because some white dwarfs, when you get above a certain mass, you can have carbon burning, carbon into oxygen. Ion. So this white dwarf is actually probably oxygen, neon, and magnesium and sodium in its core, mostly. Those are the most uh, abundant elements. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mention that. Actually, this white dwarf is so massive. All the white dwarfs, about 1, 1.1 solar masses, they probably went to carbon burning, too. Uh, but uh, yeah, the problem is that you can go through carbon burning, so you can have a stable oxygen 
uh, neon and magnesium white dwarf, but if you go past that, you will never reach the stability because you need to go to a density and a temperature that is so high to burn oxygen, then you will never be able to uh, keep it up with just electron degeneracy pressure. So if you go past oxygen, if you start oxygen burning, you either explode or you go to the neutron star phase. Uh, it's one or the other. You cannot, it cannot be a white book. You cannot, you cannot have uh, the next step or, I don't know, a, uh, neon silicon white dwarf. <laughs> could, could it possibly exist for a finite period of time? You no, know, no, because what happens, what, why, why you have a, a supernova is that if you start burning into the generic matter, uh, you have a, a runaway reaction. And so that's why it explodes, most, most likely. That's where type 1A comes from. You start burning into generic matter. Um, and so I don't know if I'm getting into too much details here, but uh, the burning is not, does not self-regulate, but because the degenerate matter, the pressure does not depend on temperature, and so you start burning more, but you're not expanding because the pressure <laughs> does not depend on temperature, and so you keep burning even more and more, and, and then you just explode the entire star. You can get to a, a, a Newton star if you start burning kind of far away from the core, so you, you get non-degenerate, and then you might have a, a kind of burning front going inside, and then in that case, not explode. But this is a big question. We don't know if new. Actually, this, we, if, there are some theories in which white dwarfs become neutron stars, but we still don't know if it happens or not. Um, OK, I only have five minutes. And I wanted to tell you about a new white dwarf that I just found. <laughs> Uh, can I? Uh, how long? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, so, because this was just the first one I looked at. <laughs> okay, this is the first one I looked at with ZTF. We're pretty lucky. <laughs> uh, because it was pretty amazing. But I'm finding lots and lots more merger remnants, so highly magnetized, rapidly rotating white doors. So I'm putting together a sample of merger remnants that can tell us what they look like, where, what did they come from, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to be a very interesting sample. But while I was looking for merger remnants, I stumbled on uh, a new type of white dwarf. Uh, and I left to ask you to um, not tweet about this, not take pictures, et cetera, <laughs> because this result is still embargoed. As I told you, like we were finishing up here, and it's now under review, and so don't. Don't talk about this. <laughs> um, but yes, we found this another viable white dwarf here is the light curve. This is not ZTF because this white dwarf is very faint. We found it with ZTF, but to get this beautiful light curve, we had, we had to use the biggest telescope. It's a biggest telescope. It's this is the Grand Canaria telescope on, on La Palma. It's 11 meters. Very big. Uh, but you can see these are like different colors, like actually different filters. Uh, and it's like very sinusoidal, 15 minutes period. So this white dwarf is rotating every 15 minutes, so slightly uh, um, slower. It's in the Cygnus uh, constellation. And now, since I told you everything about spectra, uh, I can show you another spectrum. This time, there's uh, no obvious magnetic field. Those, the red lines, I don't know if you can see them well, but these red lines indicate helium absorption lines. And the um, blue ones indicate hydrogen. Okay? So this is commonly seen in white dwarfs because if you have very little hydrogen, you can see the helium underneath, or sometimes they're mixed hydrogen and helium because they're convective. So sometimes you don't see only hydrogen, you can see the helium. And that's pretty common, OK? So this, when I saw this, it's like, OK, this looks a little bit weird. Like For a trained eye, it still looked a little bit weird for a mixed helium and hydrogen white dwarf, but nothing too strange. But this spectrum is taken over many periods, OK? So like a long exposure photograph, right? You just keep collecting photons. But so I, was, I, I thought, let's go and look at how the spectrum looks like at different rotation moments. So when the different parts of the surface are looking at us, right? And this is 
is what they look like. And this is pretty amazing, so I'll let you look at it for a while. But um, So what's going on is that these are different rotation phase. So this is like zero minutes and this is 15 minutes. Okay, so back to the beginning. Uh, and if you look at, for example, phase 0.93, so like phase zero, let's say, this is, you can see these hydrogen lines, you know, the blue lines are quite strong, right? Here, 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 while the red ones, they're not there. In fact, there's only noise there. There's nothing, 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 nothing. Now, if we go at the opposite phase, the opposite, you know, now the visors have rotated by 180 degrees, the hydrogen lines, they're not there. They disappeared. Okay, uh, no, this one, this one, they're gone, completely gone, while the helium, the red ones, are there. You see? So not there, there. You see it? Mm -hmm. So hydrogen on one side, helium on the other side. It's a double phase star. Yes, that's why we call it Janus. <laughs> because it has two phases. It has one side has hydrogen and on the other side it has helium. What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was our reaction too. What? Uh, so this is very, very exciting and um, uh, yeah, very confusing at the same time. Because why those are fluids? Right. How, so that's not sustainable, right? How do you sustain that? Exactly. Right. Um, and I, I've been looking at this for years now. And it's... Years? Yes. Yeah, I think there isn't the original culture for so one side smiling and the other side smiling. <laughs> yeah, I so think this, this is a Roman coin. So This yeah. has been going on for years. This has been stable for at least years, yes. So something is regenerating. Right? Something is keeping it stable. Yeah. So some, it's just idea? like that. What's your idea? So we've come up with a few ideas. So you have a fluid, so you need something to create this inhomogeneity on the surface. And so the only thing that we can think of is magnetic fields. So magnetic fields that are not strong enough to show up in, as, as Zeeman splitting, so changing to change the shape of the, of the lines. But you need very strong magnetic fields for that. So it's like an intermediate magnetic field can still not appear in the spectrum. But maybe it can cause this discrepancy between the two phases. And so we have different ideas. I'm going to show you one, because I have a pretty picture <laughs> for that. So this one idea is there could be a nitrogen ocean caused by the magnetic field. Because if you have a strong magnetic field on one side that is like weak, stronger on one side and on the other, you can have, you have a higher magnetic pressure, which means that it's a bit lower gas pressure. And so the hydrogen, uh, which is lighter, it's bouncing, right, compared to the helium. Can, if you have a little amount of it, you need to have a tiny amount of it. Uh, it can f float towards the low pressure, uh, the low gas, gas pressure environment and create some sort of a hydrogen ocean. And so as the wider floated, we see this pot of hydrogen Sorry, at the wider floated, we see this spot of hydrogen coming in and out of the line of sight. Uh, yes? So I have a dumb question. Planetary systems in homogeneities can last for centuries, like storms on Jupiter. Um, so why is it unusual to think about inhomogeneities being stable? Because here we're talking about a completely different system. The gravity here, it's crazy. Uh, so um, it would it would never work. And so this is a, I mean, we're talking about the atmosphere of a white dwarf, and so everything gets settled, like the, the helium would settle immediately. Because like of the much quickly. higher gravity. Which was yeah. the much higher gravity. You cannot, you, you cannot keep it stable, and especially because this white dwarf was not born yesterday. It's been around <laughs> just cooling <laughs> for a while. Sorry, I'm just finishing and I'll get to you. Uh, it's been cooling for a long time, so it's not that it just formed, and you need something to create this, this inhomogeneity. Uh, and so the magnetic field is a, 
it's one explanation. I mean, there could be different, but right now we don't have a good one. Like, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a really good analogy with the, with the spots on Jupiter because she's a very different system. Uh, but here I don't know the question. Well, I was kind of thinking the same thing that helium being a little denser, maybe it's an off-axis rotation. You know, you got helium on one side and hydrogen on the other. Uh, well, the thing is that everything that is caused by rotation cannot really work because, you know, if it's rotating, you know, it's, it, I know, I have to think about this for a little while, but if it's causing by rotation, then you always see the same, it, it would be ax, axis symmetric with the rotation axis. And so you would always see the same part, right? It would not change with the rotation. You see what I mean? And even if it's inclined, you would still see the same spot, the same whatever it is on the, if you think about, make it, I don't know, different circles or different uh, belts caused by some sort of rotation, then if you turn it around and you rotate it, you will always see the same thing because if it's caused by rotation, right? Uh, so it cannot really be pure rotation because this is something that is almost perpendicular to the rotation axis because we see zero helium on one side and zero hydrogen on the other side. So actually, this is a, even if in, in the case of a hydrogen ocean, it would have be, to be a very, you know, a very good geometry. You know, you would have to have the, you have the rotation axis that is kind of like almost 90 degrees from us, and then this hydrogen spot that is just rotating on the equator. Which is okay, I mean, it's, this is a rare object. It's fine that we found a rare object. <laughs> it's, it's 400 parsecs away, so it's very far away. So, which means that uh, it can be a rare object. If, if you found it very close to us, then it would be tricky, but it's far away, so it's okay if it, that it's rare. There's, there's no chance there's any other body there that you're not seeing. Ah, good question, because actually the first thing that comes to mind is maybe there's two white dwarfs. One is hydrogen, one is helium. Uh, but the thing is, the light curve would not look sinusoidal. It would look kind of flat, and then you would see the eclipses. Because of the occlusion, yeah. Yeah, you would see like the white dwarf coming one in front of the other, and then and then it would be on the on all the other phases would be pretty flat. Um, or and also at 15 minutes, uh, they are rotating very fast around each other, and so what you would see is that the lines would move the, because of the Doppler effect. The helium and the hydrogen yeah. lines would move in phase by a lot. Well, in this case, they're very uh, there. They don't move. They just disappear. Uh, and so that's why it's not, it's not a binary. So yeah, we, we went through all the list of possibilities. And uh, we thought about pulsations, for example. Maybe this quadrat is pulsating. But it would be even more hard to explain how does the hydrogen appear and disappear with pulsations. It's, it would be even harder to explain. I think the easiest explanation and this white dwarf is rotating and for some reason it is an homogeneous surface. It's a double phase star. Uh, so actually that's the easiest it's explanation. Not <laughs> <laughs> Why not? That's how that's how science works. You always go exclude uh, all of the more complicated ones. <laughs> Yes. What about the temperature of a typical a white dwarf? I mean, uh, not the 12 million degrees of a, a main so, sequence. So the, the white dwarf, actually, what they do is just they keep cooling their whole life. So the typical, there's not really a typical temperature. It's like they're, when they're young, right. uh, they start, you know, you, they start looking like a white dwarf at around 100,000 <laughs> degrees, uh, and then they 100,000 degrees, okay. and then they go down to you know, they get very, very hard to see it around maybe 3,000, 2,000, things like that. So uh, Janus, actually, this is another explanation that we have, but I don't have time to get into that, is due to convection, because Janus is around 35,000 degrees, and that's when convection starts in the high, it starts to be very strong in the helium layer right beneath the hydrogen. So if you have magnetic field that is stronger on one side and on the other, on the side where the magnetic field is stronger, it might inhibit convection, so convection is not happening yet. And on the side where the magnetic field is weaker, you already have convection, and you can, and the, and the helium might mix with the hydrogen, and, and, and there's so much more helium that the hydrogen completely disappears. 
So this could be another explanation. That's actually, that's my favorite explanation more than the hydrogen because it is at 35,000 degrees and that's when the, the convection starts to become stronger in the, in the helium. Uh, but I think <laughs> I really have to conclude. And uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>